So validation of your survivor that comes to you is kind of your first step to safety planning. Um, you know, your, you kind of what you're aiming to do is reduce her sense of isolation and shame and then let her know that she could have a better chance, uh, you know, a better life and if she um, can make the right kind of thing. So your responses, people never know what to say. Domestic violence, um, a lot of times, and I think most of you are nurses or social workers, so you talk about really hard stuff all the time. So I don't know that you guys would really struggle. Um, but even if you're talking to family and friends, I think that it would be a good thing to let them know these are good things to say, because people say not good things all the time, like, well, why don't you just leave, or why don't you hit them back? Those things make people feel like they could be doing better, that everybody else could leave, or, you know, I'd never tolerate that. It really implies that everybody else could deal with this in a healthy way, and you don't know what you're doing. Like, why would you do that? So. I'm sorry this is happening to your life and you don't deserve this. It's not your fault. I'm worried about your safety or I'm worried about you and your children's safety. All good things to say. And then when you think about that, and I know um, that we just talked about trauma quite a bit, and I'll run through these pretty quick, but I think it's sometimes easier to respond to people if you understand. Um, I just went to a trauma training the other day and they were one of her little slides that just kind of caught me said, instead of going, what is wrong with this person? We should probably be asking what happened to this person because there's usually a reason. Um, and these are not specific to domestic violence. Oh, they're gonna come one at a time, helpful. Um, so these are just kind of normal reactions people will have to trauma. And I go over these with clients when, they, when I did therapy and they'd come in. And so often they would say, oh my God, I felt like I was going crazy. And what you're telling me is I'm normal for what happened to me. Because you shouldn't probably really feel normal in a crazy kind of situation. So distressing recollections, distressing dreams about what happened, acting or um, feeling as if the traumatic event were reoccurring, so kind of that flashback thing. Intense distress at exposure to internal cues physical reactions and sensations upon exposure to internal cues. And obviously for the healthcare um, setting, that is extremely important because if people are touching you where bad things have happened to you and traumatic things have occurred, clearly some of this might cause some of these other things to happen. Or if you're doing sexual assault exams, um, again, clearly even, and it's wonderful that we have say nurses here because they at least understand all of this stuff before they um, are working with somebody. But you could touch them and it may have, a, it may remind them of exactly what happened even if it wasn't, they're not there for a sexual assault. Trying to avoid thoughts, feelings, or conversations associated with the trauma. A lot of times in those critical situations people think they're lying because they're not giving details and they're not explaining themselves clearly. Probably because they don't, either they are, are clearly having a hard time remembering because of the traumatic situation, as um, Julie gave, I think, with the car accident example, or they don't, they, they want to avoid it. It's embarrassing to them, they feel shameful of it, and it's a horrible memory. Trying to avoid activities, places, or people that remind you of the trauma and an inability to recall important aspects of the trauma. Diminished interest or participation in significant activities, relationships, or work. So as we're talking about your, the babies, when you think of people with their children, if you um, lose interest or don't feel like you're normal and can participate, that also happens with children, their children, and the detachment and estrangement of others, not being able to experience pleasure, joy, or loving feelings, and a sense of a foreshortened future, trying to make it go quicker. Difficulty falling or staying asleep, irritability or outbursts of anger, um, difficulty concentrating or remembering, hypervigilant, um, could be very jumpy. Um, and again, sometimes people think they're being dramatic and obviously it could very well could be trauma. I'm gonna get these up here first and then we'll go through them. I've always liked this page. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this, but I think it's super helpful for professionals too. But 
oftentimes, and again, if you're a social worker or nursing, you probably are familiar with a lot of this and you see it, but a lot of times people, they think things are sad. Um, like if you broke up with your boyfriend, that sounds sad and you're having grief. If your boyfriend has threatened to kill you, you will probably have trauma. Um, or if you had a really bad relationship, there's probably trauma going on. So these compare the difference, the two. Um, grief, your general, like, generalized reaction is sadness, and in trauma, it's terror. So your normal feeling is terror and sadness, because as you go down, the grief reactions will stand alone, and the trauma reactions will normally include the grief reaction. So normally, if somebody has traumatic um, experience and they're having both of these. So grief reactions are generally known to the public and professional, so that's how everybody's responding, as if they're grieving. And trauma reactions especially are largely unknown to the public and oftentimes professionals as well. Um, and we'll go through secondary victimization, in the, which is the problem with professionals not understanding it because people listen to us and they think we know. And then oftentimes professionals are still hurtful. Um, in gr grief, most people can talk about what happened. and trauma, most don't want to talk about what happened. And in grief, your pain is the acknowledgement of the loss. In trauma, it's the overwhelming sense of powerlessness and loss of safety. So that is what your pain is coming from. In grief, your pain is generally destructive and non-assaultive, non-destructive and non-assaultive in trauma. It oftentimes becomes assaultive um, or violent. And I would say, I don't, we haven't worked with too many people that have that, but generally if our victims do become um, maybe more violent, they generally don't realize it's a traumatic reaction. They feel very bad about themselves after they do it, so it isn't even generally like mutual abuse. They feel terrible. Um, and grief guilt says, I wish I would have or would not have done something. In trauma, it basically says, if I would have done this, it wouldn't have happened. If um, somebody dies in a car accident even, and normally grief will say, gosh, I wish I would have said goodbye to them, got to say goodbye to them. In trauma, it's more, if I would have said goodbye, if I would have got like the chance to call them before they left for the day, they wouldn't have died. So it's very different. Um, grief generally does not disfigure our self-image. Trauma generally does. And grief, dreams tend to be about the deceased and trauma. They tend to be about you as the victim. And, and grief um, generally does not involve them trauma reactions we just talked about, flashbacks, startle reactions, hypervigilance, and trauma generally can.